know what your picture of God is. Um, there was a, a university chaplain who used to, um, in Oxford, who used to ask the students, every student had to, um, to see the chaplain just once. Uh, I, I think people don't do that these days, but, but certainly some years ago they had to see the chaplain just once. And he'd ask them one question. And he said, do you believe in God? Uh, and they used to answer yes or no, obviously. Uh, and for those that, that, that said yes, he'd say, oh, you know, what's the God you believe in? What's he like? But also for the ones that said no, he said, what's the God you don't believe in? What is he like? And I think it's a great question because I think sometimes we just say, oh, you, do you believe in God? I believe in God and we're on the same page. But actually, I want to challenge you this morning to think about what is God like? I think this passage in Philippians challenges you to think what is God like? I sometimes can um, think that God is like a speed camera. In the UK, uh, uh, we have these speed cameras uh, which basically are kind of up along the side of the road and, and they're checking if you're keeping to the speed limit. Now, I don't have a very good relationship with these speed cameras. Uh, I just feel that they're, they're hiding behind bushes and lampposts like desperate to take my photograph. And so I've had my photograph taken by speed cameras far too many times. And the thing about a speed camera, you can never... Lo- I mean, you, don't, you have, okay, traffic cops by the side of the road here. You, you, you get what I'm saying? And nobody loves that moment, do you? Nobody thinks, oh, I love a speed camera. I love a speed camera. You know, it just keeps me honest and holy and doing the right thing. Nobody does that. But I think it's interesting when you think about God, you think, actually, can some people think God is like a speed camera? He's always watching you. You know, he's always waiting. And basically, if you do something wrong, flash, got your sheshi. Sinning there again. And he's kind of always watching you, always wanting to, to pull you down. He's almost like this, this kind of secret police force in the sky that's checking you out and working you out. Uh, a guy um, called Richard Dawkins, American guy, uh, uh, wrote this about his belief not in God. He said this, I think it would be rather awful if the existence of God were true. You'd never have a waking or sleeping moment where you weren't being watched or controlled or supervised by some celestial entity from the moment you were conceived to the moment you die. And then he adds, it'd be like living in North Korea. You know, this idea that you basically would be that God is this dictator in the sky who's just watching you checking you, making sure that you do something bad. And the moment you do something bad, he's going to blast you. You know, and, and we can have this idea of God as, and, and yeah, God is powerful and God is sovereign and God is in charge, you know, but, but we can put that and we can put it in the wrong place and think like God's this, this, this dictator that's all about himself. You know, the, the shocking thing about North Korea is, I, I, I won't get into too much politics, but you know, it's the People's Republic of North Korea, but the leader lives in this huge grand palace and the people live in poverty. But yet he's the people's leader. And you think, some people, some people think that about God. They think that God's just all about himself, living in the grand glory of heaven, not really concerned about us. And, and I think sometimes people that, you, that say, I don't believe in God, believe in the wrong kind of God. I think Richard Dawkins has got the wrong kind of God. I don't believe in that kind of God. You know, you can say, oh, I don't believe in God. But actually, because you, don't, you believe in the wrong kind of God. You've got the wrong view of God, and I want to try and reshape you. Maybe if God is more like this, this is something that I read in a, uh, an Ameri- online uh, in, from the States. Maybe God's like this. This is a, a clip from a newspaper article. It said, in, an 18-year-old Kentucky woman was killed when she ran into the road to save her child. The child just wandered into the roadway, and the mother wanted to get the child out of the road. Tasha Douglas, the mother, managed to throw her two-year-old son from the road, keeping him from harm. Yet she died instantly from the full-on impact of the car. Tasha's father said, I don't even think she would have thought twice about it. Love does, love does those things. And I think that's probably more like a picture of God. You know, before he's the ruler, before he's the creator, he's the father. Before all eternity, the Father has loved the Son in the Spirit. Before there was anything to rule or reign over, before anything was created, He's a loving, self-giving Father. And I want to show you Him this morning. So let's um, read Philippians uh, 
the, the fan has stopped. Good move. Thank you, person who did that. Let's read Philippians uh, 1, and we'll read through a few verses. It's, it's a long reading, but I think Paul's brilliant here. With, it contains that kind of famous hymn in the middle, uh, probably one of the first songs that ever got sung in Christian churches. So, so Philippians 2, chapter 1. So it says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit... If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude or mindset as Christ Jesus who, though he was in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Some translations say to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, if you as always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now more so in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with awe and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or complaining or arguing so that you may become pure, blameless children without fault in the warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine out amongst them like stars as you hold out the word of life. And then you will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even as I am being poured out, like a, a, a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Familiar passage to some. Who's, who's heard that passage before? It's a familiar passage to some. So, you know, I want to tread carefully. But I think that it really is a window almost into eternity. It's almost as if Paul or whoever wrote the words, Paul maybe took them from a song. And it's a window into the kind of eternity, into the heart of what God is like. And it starts off very simply. It starts, Jesus who being in very nature God. I mean, bang, that is a huge phrase, isn't it? Jesus in very nature God. You know, there's, that, that is the... The challenge that the, the disciples of Jesus, they're following Jesus around. They, they, they're going on a journey and he's doing, doing miracles, he's teaching. And they're starting to realize, wow. You know, the Jews who'd said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. These Jewish men and women are starting to go on this journey that Jesus is God. That is staggering. You know, there's that moment where the, the big storm, Jesus, there's a huge storm, and the, the, they said, it says they were very afraid of the storm. They're, you know, they the fishermen on the boat, the sh waves are coming up, they're very afraid of the storm. And then Jesus, it said he was asleep in the boat, and they go up and said, peace be still. And suddenly there's a flat calm. And it says this, it says, and then they were very afraid. They were afraid of the storm, but when Jesus calms the storm, they're very afraid. And they say, what category of man is this, that the wind and waves obey him? The truth is, he's in another category. They were making that journey. Jesus is in another category. He's not just some prophet. You know, he's not just some wise teacher. They're making this incredible journey. So Peter says, doesn't you, the Christ, the son of the living God. I mean, you've got to understand, we just kind of take that for granted. But the fact that they, they journeyed and said that God is Father, Son, and Spirit, that they made that leap is huge for them. When Jesus rose from the dead, you know, uh, down in Thomas says, you know, I, put my, I want to put my finger in the side and print of the nails. And he says, my Lord and my God. He takes the Shema, here is Israel, the Lord of God is one. And he says, you are the Lord. You are God. That's staggering. This is a God we believe in. So, so, you know, God from God, says the creed. True God from true God. Eternal, not created. 
But Paul says, Jesus, whose very nature God says, nail that down. There's no discussion here. Jesus is fully God in every single way, yet man in flesh. He says, he, were, he did not consider equality with God. It's interesting, that word consider. I don't know if, you're, if your first language isn't English. Apologize. But, but the, it's interesting to, to consider something. If you consider something you're you're looking at it you're thinking about it you're contemplating it so it's almost as if paul is saying jesus through all eternity has been looking at something he's been contemplating he's been considering something yeah you're tracking this word consider not if you're with me okay he's been considering something and actually paul says he's almost like he's been considering what it means to be equal with god he did not consider equality with god now Just understand, he's not saying, I'm not equal with God, and how can I become equal with God? Because he's already said he's fully God, okay? He's saying, he's he's almost like he's considering what it means to be like God, to be the equivalent of God. Let me explain. It's it's helpful my my son, uh, Zach, is here. Um, But throughout Zach's life, even though he doesn't know it, he's been considering something. He's now pulling your face. (laughs) He's been considering... As he sees me, he's been considering what it means to be the Kellett dad. Yeah, he's considering what is it like to be like dad, okay? And you, if you've got kids, your kids are doing the same for you. They're, they're, they're looking and saying, what is it like? So this is how it used to work in our family. Uh, when we watch a film or, uh, you know, did I get to choose the film? When we, when we had chocolates, we used to love chocolate. This is how I used to do it, really. I basically, I, I, I need to confess this, this is bad. I used to go, one piece for me. And then one piece for my wife, one piece for my kids, one piece for our kids, and then one for me. And then it would break. And then we'd go, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for you. And the kids for a while didn't realize. I mean, I'm, not ash- I'm ashamed of that. <laughs> but it was like I was, I had, and there was dad's chair in front of the TV. You know, and it was like, and, and, and I just thought, as I thought about this passage, I thought, what, what did Zach think? As he considered me, did he think, well, when I'm the dad, I'm going to get all the chocolates. When I'm the dad, I'm going to get the best seat. When I'm the dad, I'm going to say, honey, can you get me a beer? What, you know, um, is that, uh, it was, so it's almost like Zach's considering what it means. Did he see that I was using my position as the father of the family as something for my own advantage? Yeah, you tracking with me? Or did I use it to love him and care for him and pour out myself for him? I think that Paul is saying the same thing. He's saying, okay, he's saying, what is he, when God, when Jesus looks at God his Father, does he see a grasping, you know what I mean by grasping? Grabbing, self seeking, self centered dictator? Or does he see a God who gives himself away. That's about as technical it gets this morning, okay? But you, do you understand what I'm saying? So what does, what, does, what does Paul say? That Jesus, as he looks at his Father through all eternity, what conclusion does he come to to say, this is what it means to be like God? What conclusion does he come to? Paul tells us, first of all, he comes to a conclusion that it's not this. It says, Jesus who being very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be, what's it say? Grasped. Other translations say something to be exploited, something to be used for his own advantage, because they're struggling with that word. What it means is to reach out and take something for yourself. And he says, no, 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 no. God is not like that. God is not selfish and self-serving. He's not a cold-hearted dictator. Richard Dawkins is wrong about him. He's not sitting in power and glory doing it all for his own benefit. He's different. Very, very different. There is a God like that, though. There is a God like that. There's a God who thinks, actually, I'd like to be the top dog. I'd like to be the boss. I mean, he appears right at the beginning of the Bible story. I mean, the hymn writer, there's an old hymn that says, the pretended God, the serpent. 
What does he do when he comes and considers? Adam and Eve are in the garden. The first humans are in the garden. The serpent comes along and he says to them, consider what God is like. Look at his rules. Look at what his expectations. Consider what he's like. And you know what? He tells them a lie because all through himself, he's, uh, if you go the, the slide, all through himself he's been saying, it says in Isaiah 14, 14, it says, I, Satan, I will rise my throne above God. I will make myself like the most high. He's this one who wants to take advantage. He wants to put himself at the very top. I will ascend to the heavens. I'll make my throne above God. He's, he, when he's, uh, uh, as it were, the saints has been con- contemplating God. He's been thinking in his heart, I want to be above him. I want to be at the top. So when he comes to meet humanity, he says to humanity, I want you to think about God. And what is humanity? He tells humanity, you know, to be honest, if you take this fruit, you're going to be like God. You're going to sit on the top dog. You're going to grasp this fruit. You're going to take hold of this fruit and you're going to eat it and you're going to be like the top dog. You're going to be above God. You'll be like God. And he persuades humanity to think God's bad. He almost persuades humanity to think God's holding out on them. That he's like not to be trusted. That he's this horrible dictator who's just setting rules. And so humanity says, I don't want that kind of God. I'll be my own God. And, and, and Jesus talks about, about the God of this age, doesn't he? He says, what does he say? He says he comes to rob. Take what's his, not his, rob. And to steal. And to destroy and take life. He's, this, there is a God like that. But it's not our God. It's not our God. The thing is, when humanity believed the lie that God was bad and decided we're going to become these people that grasp and take and use for our own advantage, like Paul says in his passage, doing things out of vain conceit and selfish ambition. He's saying, that's what we become like. And that's what, that's what you're like, people. That's what your natural instinct as one who are born in Adam is, that's what you're like. A guy called Bill Hybels uh, from the state said this, it may not be true for m- life in Tanzania for many people, but it's true for life Uh, perhaps in the West, uh, it said, at birth our tiny hands are closed. Mine we cry as we grasp rattles and toys and then bike handlebars. At school and university it's exam results and then the hand of your girlfriend and then you grasp the lowest rung of the career ladder and hang on and climb. You grasp at financial bonuses and bigger houses and better holidays. In retirement you hold golf clubs and pension funds. And then it's walking sticks. And at the end, we clutch to the edge of a hospital bed, hanging on to life itself. But only when we die do we finally relax our grip. Our hands are closed. Our hands are closed. You know, uh, God says to David, why are your hands closed? He says, I'm the God whose hands are open. Why are your hands closed? So that's not what God is like. He's not the closed-handed, grasping God who wants it all for himself. No, when Jesus looks at what his father's like, what what looks what God is like, he says, no, no, rather, this is something else. Jesus, it says, Paul says, Jesus made himself nothing. He emptied himself. He poured himself out, if you want to say that, by taking the very form of a slave being made in human likeness. We, that is so incredibly radical to say, what is God like? God is the God who gives himself away. God is the God who humbles himself. When he considers what God's like, he says, actually, I'm going to be like that. I'm going to give myself away. I'm going to be full of self-giving love for you. Jesus is the poured out God. We see it at the Last Supper. Just the, the night before Jesus is crucified and he's having supper with his friends and he, he takes bread and wine and he, he breaks, the, breaks the bread and he says, this is my body given, given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. This is what God does. He's determined to be the giver. We've misunderstood him. 
If we think first that he wants something from us, first that he's something, he needs our worship, that he needs our staff, that he needs our money, he needs a, no, first God is the giver. He pours himself out, he gives himself away. He's the one who says, this is my very self broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. I want to give myself away. I'm the giver of life. I give life. What a pe- what, but it's interesting, Luke, if you read the, 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 the story, Luke tells what the guys are doing at this time. I, 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 men are worse at this than women. But this is amazing. Jesus is breaking bread, doing the Last Supper. And is, imagine, you know, we're breaking bread here. And Sheshi's doing the kind of Last Supper thing. Uh, and breaking bread. And, you, and at the back, there's a discussion going on. And this bit, this is what Luke says, the discussion, he says, Luke says, a dispute arose amongst the disciples of which of them was considered to be the greatest. What are we like? Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, but you're not to be like that. The one who rules is like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at table? But I am amongst you as one who serves. It's staggering, isn't it? Here's Jesus' disciples. This is you and me. Here's Jesus' disciples. And what we're processing is, what can we get out of this? What can we get out of this? We're with Jesus. He's the big hero, the dead raiser, the amazing guy. And they're processing, what can I get out of this? What can I take for myself? What can I use for my own advantage? What can I take and grasp and make myself? And they're arguing, saying, I'm going to be better than you, Shesh. Sheshi said, no, 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 I'm better than you. No, Sheshi wouldn't, would he? <laughs> my Zach, my son, no, he wouldn't. But you know what I mean? The words are like, so Jeremy and, Jeremy and Sheshi are arguing, who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. You know, and it's like Jesus is saying, I'm going to give myself away. And they're saying, I want to take, I want to take. And we're like that. I mean, men are worse than women. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Women are more relational. I mean, okay, maybe it's not good to caricature. But men are obsessed with power. You know, you are in your workplace. You know, am I climbing the ladder? Am I better than that guy? He did his presentation. I did my presentation. Am I better than him? We're desperately, constantly thinking about power and, and we want, because we want for ourselves. We want to be affirmed for ourselves. We want people to think I'm great. We want people to say, yes, you're amazing. And the Jesus' disciples are having this discussion. And it's like, whoa. But actually, they've been modeled that because that was like, it says the kings of the Gentiles were like that. They lord it over them. If you look, I think of the Roman world in that time, that Julius uh, uh, Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, the son of Augustus, he was the one, he was the ruler. And he modeled what it was like to be a ruler. If you get to the top, this is what you do. Tiberius was so, his, his, fa- his father Augustus was so desperate to climb to the top, he said, please call me div- the divine Tiberius. So here's... Uh, here's uh, divine Augustus. Here's his son Tiberius. He's been modeled. He's looking at his father Augustus and says, this is what we do. So what does he do? He goes across the whole of the, the Mediterranean basin, grasping, exploiting, taking, enslaving, demanding homage. If you've ever been to Rome, because I live closer to Rome than you guys, if you go to Rome, there's this like massive palaces on, this, on the Palatine Hill. It was almost like all the resources of the, of the Roman Empire were poured into this man's lap and that was what had been modeled it's what empires do you know that in this nation they grasp and they take and they seek for themselves but that's what they'd seen and the question is obvious who is greatest who's the one who sits at the 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 one who sits at the table or the one who serves I don't know if you ever had, if, if, if you're married, you know, your wedding reception. Imagine the wedding reception. You know, you're sitting there married. Uh, uh, Jeremy and Ange are sitting there in their wedding reception. And then everyone else can kind of see it at the table. And then Jeremy just, instead of everybody thinking, hey, it's Jeremy and Angie's big day. And, you know, and you get everybody chatting to you. They suddenly get up and say, I'm going to go and serve everyone. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, look, you might, you might think the place to be is to sit at the table and have everybody serve you. But I'm telling you what God is like. I'm the one amongst you who serves. I'm amongst you as one who serves. Jesus, it, John records it, doesn't he? He says, so we're still in the Last Supper scene. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. I mean, what would you do if you had all things under your power? 
So just ask yourself that question. All the power in the world is given to you. What, what were you going to do with it? I don't think I would do this. But God does this. Jesus knew that all that, that he'd come from the Father and God, the Father put all things under the power. That he'd come from God and is returning to God. He's fully aware that he's God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that poured water into basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Now, I don't think that this was just a fake moment. Jesus isn't thinking, hey, this is going to look good in the Bible, isn't it? It's going to look good in the Bible if I come across as humble. You know, why don't we just wash the feet? Most of the time, I'm sitting in heaven. I'm sitting in my kind of house. I'm sitting and everybody's going to kind of give me homage and give me worship. But actually, this might be a good little illustration, so I'm just going to do this. I don't think he's doing that because he's doing that to like make a good show. This is not a PR stunt. This is not the president leaving church during an election campaign. You know, this is not something that's going to look good in the papers. This is what he's like. He does what he does because that's who he is. That's what God is like. He's a, it's a staggering. You should be staggered and amazed because if you haven't grasped that that's what he's like, if you haven't understood that that's what he's like, if you haven't contemplated that that's what God is like, you should be shocked that's what he's like. And he doesn't serve and wash the disciples' feet because they're deserving it. You know, Judas gets his feet washed and he's about to betray him. Peter gets his feet washed and he's about to deny him. It's not like what we say, we'll start with the holiest person in the room. That lady at the back with a nice hat. You look holy, we'll wash your feet first. And then we'll finish with my boy Zach. <laughs> He's not doing that. He's not doing that. He's saying, I want to give myself away. I want to make you clean. I'm going to wash you. I'm going to take the form of a servant. He does that because God is self-giving. He's not grasping but overflowing. He's not exploiting but serving. He's not taking but poured out. This is amazing. There's no God like this. Other gods are worshipped in this nation. Other gods are worshipped in my nation. There's no God like this. There's no God like this. But actually, Jesus is going to go further to show what it means to be like God. Paul continues, being made in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Thank you. I mean, this, why does God do this? He does that because that is what he's like. The cross is a picture of human misery and grasping and taking and exploitation. And Jesus walks right into it and, it, and takes the full weight of it upon himself. To, Paul, Paul adds even death on a cross. Like the lowest, the most foul, the most degrading, the most disgusting way to die. Why does God do that? Because that's where our grasping and exploitation and sin takes the world. And Jesus walks right into it and says, I'm going to change it. I'm going to transform it. Jesus is, uh, he says this, didn't he? He says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life for many. Greater love, says Jesus, says no man, then he gives his life for his friends. So somebody might do it for a hero. Somebody might do it for somebody amazing. They might give our life for a great cause. But he gives our, his life for us while we were grasping, exploiting, self-centered, proud sinners. There's no God like this. He's betrayed and arrested, whipped, spat upon and led away and killed, naked on the cross. The Son of Man marred beyond recognition slowly dying in the darkness, forgives his executioners, holds out, holds out life to a thief, pours out kindness to his mother. There's no sense of grasping self, even in that moment, no sense of self-indulgence in that moment. This is a God who's poured out. Mark, at the moment of his death in the Mark's Gospel 15, records with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. 
And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said this, surely this is what it means to be God. Surely this man is the son of God. You got to understand that, as I said, that each Roman legionary would have had coins in their pockets. And the coins in their pockets would have said, Tiberius, Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. In other words, every coin, every time you spent money, every time you used anything in the, the empire, there was this little picture that's saying, this is what it means to be divine. And the Roman soldiers would swear allegiance to the divine Tiberius. But this soldier, seeing how Jesus pours himself out, how he gives himself away, says, not this. This is what it means to be God. This is what it means to be God. Truly, this man is the Son of God. A theologian said this. It said, uh, Daryl Johnson, uh, I love this quote, says, uh, Calvary reveals what it means to be God. I don't think this is just some rescue mission that God's doing and then he's back on his throne in glory. Even if you look in Revelation, he's always the lamb on the throne. He's always the poured out, crucified one on the throne. Calvary reveals what it means to be God. Self-emptying, sacrificial love is the proper expression of divine status. And the father so loves this. He sees his son and so loves it. He says, this life, this self-giving love, this life of poured out giving, I'm going to exalt it to the primary place in the universe. This life, this is the life that's going to be exalted in glory. Not the life of grasping and taking and self-centeredness that's going to be taken out and, 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 and emptied, destroyed. No, this life is going to be exalted. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. God has taken this Christ, this self-emptying one, and placed him on the throne of the universe and says, This now is what it means for people for you to be like God. When you worship God on his throne, you should think this is the response to divine status. This is the response to seeing Jesus in his glory. To say this is the, truly this man is the son of God. But actually there's, there's something more. Paul doesn't just leave the passage there. We could leave it passage there and think that's an interesting little bit of theological exercise. You know, it made me think a little bit about God. That, that's helpful. I like that. Paul then says, okay, so what about you? The poured out God is looking for a poured out people. The self-giving God is looking for a self-giving people. Paul has said right at the beginning, Philippians 2 verse 1, it says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. If you're a Christian, you're one with him. You're joined with him. His spirit, your spirit. His character becoming your character. Paul says, we share, sounds like, uh, sorry, Peter says, it's almost shocking, we partake or we share of the divine nature. So we are little Christ. That's what Christians mean. That's what they call them, isn't it? Little Christ. So what do little Christ who follow the poured out God, how do they live? Let's land with these four little, four little helps. So we're back in Philippians 2. It says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you to will and to act to fulfill his good purpose. I, I could have, I, if my hands weren't full and we had water here. Imagine if I had a, a, a bowl of, I had a cup and below it had a bowl. This is what it means to work out your salvation. It doesn't mean try harder to please, to please God. That doesn't mean, when he says work out your salvation, it doesn't mean try harder, try harder, and then God will love you. What it means is, is God is at work in you, almost like water poured into a cup and poured into you and poured into you. It says God is at work in you, so you overflow. So you overflow. Sometimes I think, man, I need to try harder to be good and humble. 
But actually, the way it works is that God has poured this life of Christ into me. It's like he pours it into me. By, so Paul says in Romans 6, doesn't he? So God has poured out his love in our lives by the Holy Spirit he's given us. As a Holy Spirit people, we say, God, pour your life in me. And you pour your life in me. And what happens is that we work then. We do God's work. It's natural for us to pour out. If you're poured into, you cannot not pour out. That's what it is. It's natural for you. As you go into your world and whatever part of the, you know, however you live in this society, you go into your world, it's natural for you to pour out. It's natural for you to work out your salvation. It's not, it's not natural anymore for you to be grasping and self-centered and self-focused and climbing the ladder and saying who's better. That is no longer natural for you. What is natural for you is that you work out. What God is working you, you're working out there. Then he says, let's carry on. He says, uh, become pure and blameless. How? Jesus has done that in us to make us pure and blameless. Children of God without fault in a warped, crooked, grasping, self-centered generation. Then you will shine out. So we have work out, shine out among them like stars. You know, there's something amazing if you're a follower of Jesus. You shine. You shine. People should say to you, you know, there's something about you. They should. Thank you for nodding. Yes, they should. They should say there's something about you. My wife's a school teacher. She's a lovely lady. Works in a, a, a school for, for children with learning difficulties and special needs. It's a constant pour out. These kids swear at her. They spit. They're really damaged physically and emotionally. But every day she goes in and shines out. Thank you. And, and, and what happens, you know, that one, somebody who worked with her said, Naomi, there's something about you. And she didn't go home and say, yeah, I'm amazing. I am the lady. She didn't do that. She just said, isn't, she said, Howard, isn't that what they're supposed to say about us? That we shine out. Jesus says, come on, guys. Get your light out from under the basket, under the bowl, and shine out. Guys, as you live in your culture and in your, in your world, you should shine out. You will shine out. The only way you won't is if you decide to hide it under a basket. The only way you won't if you decide, actually, I'm just going to grasp and... And do things for myself out of self-interest and vain ambition. That's not going to shine. That's a black hole. It's like I'll never be filled. I'll never be filled. I'll never be filled. Like a black hole. Sucking in even light. Nothing can escape. No, we're not like that. We shine out. A couple more. Hold out. It says, then you will shine out amongst them. Amongst them. This is this warp and crooked generation like stars in the sky. As you hold out the word of life. You know, it's not just good to shine out and let everybody think you're amazing. The way you live your life, the way you do your family, the way you conduct yourself with your money, the way you work with your neighbors and friends and work colleagues. There's something that shines bright about you. But Paul, Paul says, no, no, no. Actually, there's something more to hold out. He says, hold out the word of life. You need to speak out. Your job, people, to image the, the poured out God, your job to image the humble God is to hold out the word of life. Just as Jesus took bread and broke it and says, this is my body given for you. You are to take the gospel, take the truth of Jesus and said, this is for you. This is for you. Now people weren't, loads of people uh, heard about Jesus, didn't love him, didn't follow him. So it's going to be the same for you. But that is your job. Not in legalistic condemnation. You know what Jehovah's Witnesses here saying, like, if you knock on 500 doors, you might get to heaven. This is about saying, actually, I'm going to hold out this amazing truth. Hey, you've believed in the wrong God. There's a God who loves you, who's for you, who gives himself away from you to hold out this gospel. Hold out this gospel. And then the last one, Paul says, let's read from China. Then you'll shine out amongst them like stars as you hold out the word of life. Let me just say on that hold out. That is the job of the church. You're not here for a bless up. You're not here for like something for your own advantage. Here's a nice loving community that keeps you warm and safe in the difficult times of economic situations. You know, they, the church does that, but ultimately you're here to hold out. You're here to hold out the gospel. You're here to shine out across the road, down the street. You know, I, I feel moved coming here and thinking that, that, that you know, 
the just the vast numbers of people. The vast numbers of people. Now there's lots of churches on street corners, but there ain't many great churches like this. Sorry, I can say that. I'm just looking from outside. But you know, you've got an amazing message. You've got an amazing message of Jesus to hold out. This is not about church going, attending the building on a Sunday. This is about this life here, transforming life. And then Paul finishes, he says, hold out the word of life. Then you'll be able to boast on the day of Christ. We boast in this. We boast in our poured outness. We boast in Christ crucified. That's what Paul says. I'm going to boast in that. That I did not run my uh, run or labor in vain. And then Paul says, but even I am being poured out like a drink offering on the service and sacrifice that comes from your faith. You know, there's lots of Christianity out there that says if you follow Jesus, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. And God does make you healthy. God can heal. God can bless you financially. But actually, Jesus says, if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, empty himself, Pour himself out. Take up the cross. And follow me. This is what we're called to. We're not called to easy. We're called to say, I'm going to come like him. The foot washing servant. The crucified one. That's the life we're called to. And I think, who is up for this? I'm not up for it. But God has poured out his love in my life. And I am. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. We're not fit for this task. Lord, we feel sometimes we're working at all the wrong things, not overflowing with your work in us. Lord, we, we're sh- desperate to shine for all the wrong reasons. We're holding out all the wrong things to make ourselves look good, and we're pouring ourselves into all the wrong places. But Lord, we just pray, let your gospel come, that we would consider Jesus. Consider Jesus, that we'd look at the crucified one, we'd look at the servant-hearted one, we'd look at the poured out one, and Lord, you would transform us. Lord, I pray for God's tribe. I pray for a, a bright, shining community that shines out beyond these school grounds, that shines out into every place that these people touch. Lord, I pray for a community of confidence and boldness and faith that says, I'm going to hold out the gospel of Jesus because there's no one like this. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would pour ourselves out, not just on Sunday serving rotors, but pour ourselves out for the gospel. Lord, I pray for myself. Deliver me from easy comfort. I pray, Lord, that I would be a cross taker up and follow you, that I'd lay my life down daily. And I pray for these guys that they would take up their cross and say, I'm pouring out my life for a great cause, for Jesus and his gospel. Amen. Amen.